God says he left the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage pile. That's what the scripture says. All that the children know here is garbage. Almost everyone in this community works in the trash dump, including the kids. It's like a time machine. They walk in and become adults. They get hurt a lot by knives, mirrors, and aluminum. Malnutrition and violence are the norm there, and most kids have never gone to school before. Four years ago, I helped start this school right across from the Citadel. This is the front line of the battle. Until 2018, we didn't have any food at school. We started with zero. We even had a child passed out in class because she hadn't had anything to eat in more than 24 hours. It was very hard for us because kids were always hungry. I went looking for someone who could help, and I found Convoy of Hope. Now, we feed the kids every day. Because they had eaten, they are coming alive and learning more. For them to know that food is here, it gives them a sense of security that they lack in the rest of their life. Every child here is a treasure. Because of the food that Comboy gives, combined with the education we're providing, the kids can keep dreaming. And if we just give them one chance, we can prove that they are valuable and that they could do something rather than just stay in poverty. God is doing something great here, and His promises are coming true. So we just watched a video uh, for One Day to Feed the World, which happens through Convoy of Hope, and that is happening next Sunday, December 20th, which is Christmas Sunday here at New Life. So you'll see these envelopes sitting on the chairs around you, and that's what these are for. So One Day to Feed the World is basically saying that we can give one day of our wage to feed kids just like the kids that you saw in the video, and not just provide food, but when you feed a kid, I mean, like, nobody likes to sit in school hungry, right? Nobody likes to do anything hungry. And so when you feed a child, you support them, support their education, support them playing and making friends. And so I want to encourage you next week, this is, yeah, just prepping for one day to feed the world, prepare um, to either give, yeah, one day of your wage or whatever you can give to help support um, kids in the world who need food. Um, and so, yeah, that is next Sunday, and that is what these are for. So this Sunday, or this weekend, has been Boldly Go Weekend, and a lot of you guys stepped up to serve at In a Pinch this weekend, and I've heard really amazing things. I've been on vacation, so I wasn't there. So if you have a good story about what happened, tell me, because I would love to hear it. Shami said that it was amazing, and so yeah, really good things happening. And In a Pinch is actually here with us this morning. So I'm going to invite Jennifer on up here. And Jennifer is going to tell us just a little bit about um, what In a Pinch does, mission, vision, all that good stuff. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Jennifer Meyer, and I'm the president of the board of In a Pinch, and I'm also one of the founders of the, uh, the nonprofit. And our mission is to meet the immediate needs of local foster families in Grant County. And we do that by making kits of three days worth of necessity items, um, clothing, toiletries, diapers if it's a little kid. We try to do shoes, um, coats if it's wintertime. So three days of whatever your foster child would need. Um, but we kind of operate outside of that. And anytime anyone comes to us with a need, we just fill it the best that we can. So we've worked a lot with the women's shelter here in town, um, both for the women and for their children. And uh, just anytime we're presented with a, a need, we try to fill it if we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, we are, you can stay here. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And we are so thankful to have just gotten to be a little bit a part of that this weekend. And we have uh, something we would like to give you. So you guys, you guys did this. So what's about to happen, you, did this through your Kingdom Builders giving. This is a check for $1,000 um, to In a Pinch that will help buy them a washer and dryer. So yeah, guys. we are <laughs> thankful for you. Yes! <laughs> and 
we would love to pray for you okay. as well. Yes, thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for Jennifer and the work that In a Pinch is doing with our, um, within our community. Oh God, we thank you for the ways that they're stepping up to serve and love on families and provide um, what they need when they need it. Lord, and I just pray that you would bless them um, as they continue to do that and provide what they need to provide for others. Um, yeah, God, in those moments when they need support and need provision, we just pray that you would meet them there in that. Because, God, what they're doing is truly, truly incredible. God, we pray just your blessings and love over the kids and the families that they support and impact. And, yeah, God, we're thankful to just be a small part of it. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. You're welcome. Wasn't that fun? You guys did that. That's so awesome. Okay. So <laughs> I just got back uh, from vacation with my family. Like I just said, that's why I haven't been here um, for Bully Go Weekend. Kind of sad that I missed it. I mean, I love my family. I love, we went to uh, Gatlinburg, which is the mountains. That's, that's what I love. The woods and hiking and all that good stuff. And I've been really looking forward to it. So it was a lot of fun, but I'm also really thankful to be back here uh, with you all. There's something about just being in your home and in your bed, and so I am thankful to be back here with you all and to talk about joy. So I am pretty open about the fact that I am a worst-case scenario thinker, and I'm sort of pessimistic. And so a lot of people don't think that when they meet me. They're like, Rachel is like cheerful and friendly, like pessimistic doesn't really fit with her because I try to have a positive attitude about things. And I don't mean that I'm like pessimistic in the sense that I am negative or I'm like Rachel Raincloud um, all the time. <laughs> I just mean that my default is when I'm thinking about what if, my default is what if bad, not what if good. Um, a couple years ago, I was going to have a conversation with somebody, and I was really nervous about it. And so I was talking through it with one of my friends, and she was like, okay, well, Rachel, just tell me, like, try to think through the different scenarios of how this could go. So I start being like, well, it could do, this could happen, or it could go this way, or this. And she was like, I'm going to stop you right now, because every single thing you just said, you, all you listed was bad scenarios. She was like, what if it goes good? She was like, there's a good chance that this conversation goes well. And I stopped and I thought, and I was like, honestly, I had not thought that it could go any other way other than being completely humiliating for me. Um, I had only thought of all the bad things that could happen. And so when she said that, it stuck with me because I realized I think like that all the time. I think, what if all the bad things instead of what if the good things. And so as we get rolling here today, I want you to take a second and think, what is your reaction to good news? I share all that with you to say, sometimes good news makes me nervous. Good news feels too good to be true to me. Sometimes I'm skeptical of it. And so what is your reaction to good news? Maybe you're like me and you're a little skeptical and good news makes you feel, well, nervous. Or maybe good news makes you feel really excited and filled with joy. And if you have a notebook, Write it down. Write down how good news makes you feel. And if you're joining us online, stick it in the comments. How does good news make you feel? In this series, we're talking about how when Jesus came, he brought joy. And today, we're zeroing in on the truth that the good news brings joy. And to do that, we're going to walk through several different scriptures. So those will be on the screen so you don't have to go like wildly flipping through your Bible. I remember growing up in church and Sunday school, they would always be like, these are the scriptures we're going to go through. And I would like try to turn to it, but I would never get there in time. And then they'd be reading it and then I'd be panicked because I wasn't there. So it'll be on the screen. So no pressure, but you can follow along in your Bible if you want to as well. So first we're going to jump in to Luke 2. And if you've grown up going to church, you know that Luke 2 is one of like the Christmas stories. It's one of the accounts of Jesus's birth. And so Luke 2 tells us that Mary and Joseph, those are Jesus's earthly parents, had to travel to Joseph's hometown to be counted in a census. So it's like if everybody had to go back to their homes to be counted. And it was kind of like crazy and chaotic. It's kind of like when we travel for the holidays now, right? Everybody goes back home to your family and the house is like overflowing 
with people. And so Mary and Joseph get to um, Joseph's hometown, and there isn't really anywhere suitable for them to stay. I mean, if you think about, like, when your whole family comes home for Christmas, the house is, like, jam-packed. And so that's kind of what happens to Mary and Joseph. There's nowhere for them really to go. So they end up kind of staying in, like, a barn sort of setting amongst like the animals just like imagine that like you're just sitting there you're very very pregnant and you're just sitting next to like a little cow here and that's kind of like what's happening for mary and she also did this whole journey like very very pregnant so just think about that um and yeah so they end up staying with the animals because it's somewhere and mary actually gives birth to jesus on this trip in this setting so Mary and Joseph are enjoying their newborn son. And if this was a movie, we would have already had that whole scene where we're like in the stable setting. And it, now it would cut to a different scene where we're like in a field and there's grass and there's like lots of stars and you can kind of hear crickets in the background. I don't really know if crickets live in that part of the world, but in my movie, in my movie mind, they do. So you hear like crickets and it's yeah dark and there's grass and you can hear like sheep faintly bleeding in the background. And that's because there were shepherds nearby where they were and they were watching the sheep at night. And so these guys are basically working like the night shift at the 7-Eleven. Just chilling, watching their sheep. And what happens next is basically like the equivalent of if a car came crashing through the storefront window into the Slurpee machine. So what happens next is like a whole bunch of like angels and like God's glory and light appear in the sky. So like even more dramatic than car crash into the Slurpee machine. And so understandably, the shepherds are like freaking out. And so Luke 2, 10 through 11 tells us, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. But why was that good news? What's happening in this moment, whether the shepherds like, could fully grasp that yet or not, is that this is like a moment when maybe the biggest promise God has ever made to his people is like, coming really into motion. I mean, it's already been in motion, but this is like a defining moment because God promised his people for years and years and years that there would be a savior. And they're just kind of sitting here like, okay, God, where is the savior? Because this is years in the making. And this is the moment where God's plan to save is starting to unfold in a really big way. Because not only did God send a Savior, he sent his Son, who is divine, just like God. And we know that because the angels call him the Messiah, the Lord. And that's a title that lets us know that God's Son, Jesus, is divine, just like God. Fully man, fully God. That's who Jesus is. And this plan was really much bigger than anybody could have possibly imagined, even though that God had communicated it to them and clued them in and kind of kept them in the loop. They, to the fact that there would be a Savior and a Messiah, they didn't have a ton of details about what it would look like exactly. They actually kind of had like a false idea in their heads of what this was going to look like. And we see that later in Jesus' life, fast forward about... Um, when he gets into his public ministry, we see this like more. They thought that it was going to be like a government leader or a war hero, somebody who would vindicate them through executive power or military might. And that's really not what happened at all. God sent a human baby, like very different than what they were expecting. But the kingdom that God was establishing, the kingdom that God was ushering in when his son was born, it looked really different than what they expected. But it was good. So if we fast forward about 30 years from Jesus' birth, that's about when his public ministry begins. And it's during this like three-ish year period of time that Jesus performs miracles. He teaches. He tells stories that help people understand what the kingdom of God is like. And he shares what the good news is really about. The good news of the gospel is this. John 3.16 sums it up. For this is how God loved the world that he gave his one and only son, 
so that everybody who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Put another way, the good news is this in Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The good news is that the Savior is God's Son. He is divine himself, and he left heaven in all of its glory and splendor to come to earth and die a criminal's death on a cross to pay for the sins of all who call him Lord and invite them into eternal everlasting life with him. Because he didn't stay dead, he rose again in victory. The good news is that before we had the chance to realize what we are, before we saw our sin and said we were sorry, before any of that happened, Christ died for us. I mean, like, just sit in that for a moment, because there are times when my friends have done something that's hurt me. They might, it might not even be that big a deal, but they've hurt me, and I don't even want to talk to them until they decide to address it and apologize. And Christ died for us before we even realized we were wrong. The good news is that there is freedom from oppression, not just from government or worldly systems, but from how our sin weighs us down, the way depression, anxiety, addiction, disease weighs us down. There is freedom from all of it. The good news is that there's healing and there's hope, and there's not just redemption, but there is restoration, and it's comprehensive, and it's holistic. The good news is that the God that died to save you loves you. It wasn't an act that was done out of duty or obligation. He walked the path to the cross because he wanted to, because he loves you. And he would have done it if you were the only one. He would have walked the path if it was just for you. The good news is that if you believe, you'll inherit the kingdom. Whether you're rich or poor, weak or strong, no matter what your skin looks like, whether you're male or female, whether you have a college degree or you dropped out of high school, whether you work the night shift at the 7-Eleven or you make six figures, the kingdom of God, the good news is for everybody. The good news is that even though we've done despicable things and dishonored our Father, He welcomes us home with open arms. He gives us a place to belong, and He wipes all those despicable things away. And that's just a little snippet of what Jesus spent His years of ministry trying to communicate. And He teaches this message. He passes it along to others, not just so that they'll know and hear it for themselves, but so that they can tell other people. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends 72 people out into the world with good news, and he gives them instructions on what to do. And so they go out, and they heal, and they tell the people, the kingdom of God is near. And this is what happens when they come back. Luke 10, 17 says that when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. When the disciples came back, they were filled with joy because they saw the power of what the good news can do. They saw what the authority that Christ had given them could do. They saw that Jesus heals and Jesus saves, and being able to be a part of that brought them joy. And maybe you have experienced what the disciples experienced. Maybe you have shared the good news with somebody, and you've had a front row seat to that moment where it just clicks, and the light bulb goes off, and they realize that their life can be different. Maybe you've prayed for healing with somebody. Maybe you've prayed healing over somebody, and your prayer was answered. Because sharing the good news isn't just the job of pastors or people who work in churches. It's the job of everybody who believes. Every single person who has accepted Christ as their Savior has been called and ordained to share this news. You have been ordained by God to go into the world and tell people about who he is and what his kingdom is like. And the cool thing is, is that God didn't have to do that. 
In this grand plan to save the world, he didn't have to include us in it. He didn't have to let us be a part of it. He could have done it all himself. He could have found another way because I'm pretty sure that we are not the most efficient way to do this. We are flawed and we get scared and we get the message wrong sometimes and we get in our own way and we get in God's way. And there's probably a better way to do this because we mess it up and it gets messy. But he wanted us to be a part of it. It reminds me of when I was younger. There was one time me and my sister were making pizza um, in our kitchen. And I think my mom probably could have just done it all herself. I mean, I'm a sloppy cook now, so I was probably even sloppier then. Um, And my mom probably could have done it all herself with a lot less mess and stress. But she let me and my sister do it and be a part of it because it brought us joy. It was fun for us, and we got to see our pizza and say, I, I made that, and it tastes good. And we got to be a part of the process, and that brought her joy, that her kids got to be a part of it and experience joy. And that's what God does for us in allowing us to be a part of this big picture plan in revealing who he is. He equips us to share this news with the people in our lives. There was probably a more efficient, less messy way, but he chose us chose you and me to get to be a part of it. Because the good news doesn't just bring joy when you hear it. It brings joy when you share it, too. And sharing it is the biggest way that the world knows. Sharing it is the biggest way that lost people get found. I was on vacation um, in the mountains, and so I got to go out on, like, a couple in the woods and on a couple trails and so if you were in the woods and you were on a trail and you knew where you were going and you saw somebody who really did not know where they were going they were really turned around you could stand there and you could hope that maybe some sort of instinct would kick in and they would figure out where to go or you could tell them what you know you could show them your map or you could say hey I know this path I know where we're going. Why don't we walk together? That's right there is part of why we do life together, why we have life groups, because we get to say, I'm walking toward Jesus. Why don't we walk together? Because it's better that way. In Luke 15, Jesus is hanging out with some sinners, with some lost people, some people who are really turned around on their trail. And he was out eating lunch with them. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees, are like, Jesus, what are you doing? So he tries to explain it to them, and he tells these three stories about lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And so Jesus explains that if you're a shepherd and you have a hundred sheep, and you lose one of them, you're going to go looking for the one. And when you find the one, you're going to be excited that you found it. And you're going to tell your shepherd friends about it. And you're going to party because you found the one. Because that's exciting. You're not going to celebrate because the other 99 didn't run off. You're going to celebrate because you found the one. To further explain the point, Jesus says, Okay, so what if a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one? She is going to go looking for it. And she's going to be excited when she finds it because she found something that she lost. And she's going to tell her other friends, and they're going to celebrate because they found the lost thing. And I think we all relate to this, right? We lose something, even if it's not something that important, and especially something when it, like, when it is something important, you feel this way. You feel excited when you find it. So take a second and think of a time when you lost something. And if you're joining us online, maybe put what you lost in the comments. And while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a story of a time that I lost something kind of recently. Um, Earlier this year, I was packing up all my stuff from Ohio to move back to Indiana. And I have this ring that I had worn every day for like years, and it has the word faith um, engraved on it. And so it's not super valuable, but it meant something to me. And so that morning, when I was getting ready to leave, I noticed that I couldn't find it. And so I looked all through my room, and it wasn't there. And so I was like, okay, I have to, like, get on the road. So I'm just going to assume that I put it somewhere, and now can't remember 
where it is. So I'll just assume it's all in my stuff because I have to go and it's not anywhere here. So before I left um, town in Ohio, I had stopped to get gas. And so I got out of the car to get gas. When I went to get back in, my ring was sitting on my seat, just right there, like it had fallen out of my pocket or something. And I was so excited and relieved to see it because I thought I, like, there was a good chance I had lost it, even though I was like, I'll just have faith, it's in my stuff. I was also like, I could have lost it. But there it was. And I imagine that when you found your thing that you lost, you felt excited and relieved. And that excited feeling is what heaven experiences. Luke 15 tells us that heaven experiences that feeling when one person repents, when one person accepts the good news. Luke 15, 10 says, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Because the good news brings joy when we hear it. And the good news brings joy when we share it. And the good news brings joy when anyone believes it and repents. The good news brings joy to heaven when one sinner says, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask forgiveness for what I've done. I believe that Jesus can and did save me, and I declare him as the Lord of my life. Those words trigger like a monster party in heaven. And Jesus illustrates this beautifully in the last of the three parables in Luke 15, the parable of the lost son. So I'll recap it for us really quick. If you didn't get a chance to read it this week, I encourage you to read it soon because it's a classic. You can never read it too many times. So Jesus says there was a son that, and we kind of get from the story that the son was kind of greedy and sort of insensitive because he asked his father for his inheritance before the father had died. So it would be like if I was like, Hey, Dad, I know that you're going to leave your truck to me in your will, um, but can I just have it now instead? <laughs> That's basically what happens. But the dad gives it to his son, and so the son leaves, and he parties, and he spends all the money on dumb stuff like video games. And he ends up not being able to support himself. And so he's eating pig slop, and he starts thinking, he's like, you know, the servants in my father's house have it pretty good. I mean, better than this. So why don't I go back there and beg my father to let me be a servant in his house? And this is like if you were set up to be the CEO of a company, but you left and you messed it all up, and now you have to go back and beg for a job to clean the bathroom. That's what the son is about to do. So he goes home. The son goes home. He is ready to repent. And the father sees him. He sees him from a long way off. And before he even heard his side of the story, he's going to meet him, to welcome him home. And the son repents. The son says, I'm not even worthy to be your son. But the father says, no. Bring the best clothes. We're going to have the best food. And we're going to have a party. Because my son, my son was lost, and now he's found. My son came home. And I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the good news of the gospel is that when we repent, God calls us his sons, and he welcomes us home. And girls, we don't get left out of this. I have to touch on this because I am a girl. Um, we don't get left out of this. Back in Bible days, being a daughter was like nothing. Women did not have rights. They went from being somebody's daughter to being somebody's wife. And if you didn't have a man, you were destitute. And that's how we end up with the book of Ruth, right? Ruth and Naomi, they don't have husbands, and so they have to go on this whole journey. But God gives his daughters all the rights of a son. God gives his daughters an inheritance. And that was crazy. That was unheard of. And I have to, I had to say that because, yeah, I'm a girl. And girls, I hope that you know that if there are guys in your life that make you feel like you're nothing, there's a guy, there's a father who has an inheritance for you. That is real. Then that is not too good to be true. We're coming to the end here, and so I want to go back to where I started. I shared that. Good news makes me skeptical, and good news makes me nervous. But 
The good news of Jesus isn't too good to be true. It isn't a cause for doubt or skepticism, and that's because it's real. It's true, it's irrefutable, and the source is trustworthy. God's love for us and intent to set us free is the realest thing in each of our lives. I find that I understand God's word best when I put myself in it and I imagine. So sometimes I imagine myself like in the story of the prodigal son or sometimes um, what I'm about to share with you next is something I imagine that helps me really understand um, the good news. Not a Bible story, just something that is helpful um, for me. Sometimes I imagine myself um, in a courtroom and I'm standing in front of a judge and I'm guilty, and I know it, and the jury knows it, and everybody there knows it, and my lawyer knows it, and there's no way to really spin it. I'm guilty of every charge that's brought against me, and I deserve the punishment, whatever punishment that I'm going to receive. I deserve what is coming to me. And I imagine this, and I let myself sit in this moment, deserving the conviction and the condemnation, the death sentence, basically, that's coming. And I let myself sit in that because if we don't realize how bad the bad news is, it's easy to miss how good the good news is. When we fail to realize how extensive our sin issue is, we can cheapen God's grace. We can cheapen the good news. Think about it like a car, okay? So I drive a white car, and I've gotten a couple little scratches on it um, a couple times, but... Um, my dad touched them up for me with like a little car paint pen that probably wasn't all that expensive. But if I had like really scratched it or worse, if something was wrong with like my engine or my battery or something that like impacted how the car actually worked, that would be way more expensive to fix. That's not like a paint pen fix. And if we start to think that our sin is just cosmetic, we don't realize that actually, no, this is not a cheap fix. This is like a total reworking, and it's costly. So come back to the courtroom with me. After I sit in that for a little bit, I think about somebody walking in and whispering to the judge, and all of a sudden the judge says, I'm sorry, I think we're looking at the wrong file. Somebody just brought in the right one, and you're good. You're free. You can go. And I let myself sit in that moment. And that deal feels too good to be true. But that's what Jesus offers each of us. To stand before God, a God who is holy and knows everything you've ever thought, Everything you've ever done, everything that you were about to think or about to do or wished you'd thought or wished you'd done knows you inside and out, all the bad stuff, all the good stuff. And instead of judging us based on our file, which is filled with all this garbage, he throws it out and he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He judges us based on Jesus' file, Jesus' perfect, faultless, sinless file. He just throws ours out, and he sees us clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Because even the best of the best things we do, even our best version of righteousness, the Bible says is dirty rags compared to Jesus's. And that is good news. And it's real, I promise. You were expensive. Redemption isn't cheap. You weren't a car with scratches. You were totaled. But God paid to have you redeemed and restored. And when we realize how messed up we were and how messed up we are, but also realize that Christ died to pay the price for that, we see the fullness and the magnitude of his love and his grace. And it leaves me in awe. And I hope that you feel that way too. So today, as we close, if you've heard the good news and believe it and have repented, share it. It doesn't have to be today or tomorrow, but 
Think of somebody in your life who needs to hear it and start working on how am I going to share the good news with this person? And sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you're planting a bunch of little seeds before you actually get there, but it's worth it. And if you hadn't heard the good news, or if you haven't repented and you haven't believed yet, now I want to create a moment for you to do that. So here in a few moments, I'm going to pray a prayer that does just that. And you can pray with me to repent and confess Jesus as the Lord of your life. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. Everybody go ahead and um, bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I've done some really awful things. But I want to ask your forgiveness, and I want to ask you to be the Lord of my life. I'm so thankful for your love and your grace and what that means uh, for me. In your name I pray. Amen. If today is the day that the good news caused you to believe, and if today is the day that you committed your life to Jesus, we're going to celebrate that right now with all of heaven because it's a party. So give me your best party clap, shout, woo! Yes, woo! And if you're joining us online, my favorite emoji is the hat with the blower thingy. So put that in there. It's a great way to celebrate. Um, and also, if today, um, if that's you today, we have a special gift for you. So if you're online, stick it in the comments, and we will send it to you. If you're in person, just come see us at the guest services station um, after service. So before you go, if you look at the screen, there's going to be the challenge and questions for this week. So the challenge is to identify one person in your life who you can share the good news with in the next 12 months. Now, don't feel like you have to wait 12 months. This is just saying we're looking forward to 2021. So be thinking about next year, as we head into this next year, who is one person who I really intentionally want to share this good news with? And the questions are, are you skeptical of good news? Why are we not? And how have you experienced joy as a result of the good news? Thank you guys for joining us for worship today. We love you so much, and we will see you soon. Have a great week, everybody.